Hello, Lydia, could you could you just um, put your mic on just to let us know um, if everyone's if and when you're ready? Yep. Yeah, OK, <laughs> thank you. All right, well, thank you um, for coming and joining us today uh, for the uh, Pakistan Floods Solidarity pop up fundraiser uh, events program. Um, downstairs, I'm, I'm currently sitting upstairs in the Onka office with one of the panelists, Nahal Badra, and um, we're going to be speaking for about an hour with, with Nahal and two other um, eminent academics and scholars on the topics uh, on, on the um, issues that have issues around the um, catastrophic flooding that has affected um, Pakistan in the last several weeks been driven out of the news by our media's priorities and um, lack there's a lot of there's a there's a grave lack of um, discussion or insight uh, at the kind of cultural level as to what's going on and why there so I'm really happy to have um, these three thinkers join us online today to do a bit of analysis and reflection so um, very kindly, um, Dr. Nicola Khan is um, discussant and chair of the event, so I'm going to introduce Nicola and hand over to her um, shortly. Um, just to say, we've got about an hour together um, online and um, we're recording this talk, so thank you. <clears throat> Nicola is a reader in anthropology and psychology and a co-director of the Centre for Spatial, Environmental and Cultural Politics at the University. Brighton. She works on areas of migration, mobilities, and mental illness in conflict and post-conflict societies in Asia and Europe. In Pakistan's megacity of Karachi, on transnational refugee migration from Afghanistan, and more recently on irregular Pakistani and Afghan migrants in France. And Nicola has published four books. So I'll hand over to you, Nicola. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Stephanie, um, for that introduction, and thank you so much to Onka for hosting us as part of your series on the events of events on the Pakistan floods. Thank you for all the good work that you do in collaboration with the centre and with us at the University of Brighton and also with, at the University of Sussex. So good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to this event, which is entitled Pakistan Floods neo-colonialism, climate injustice, and the causes and outcomes of the floods. So as Persephone said, we have an hour during which I and our two speakers will set the context for the floods, uh, discuss some of the different ways these are being represented and mobilized in both public discourse and in international politics, as well as community local politics such as here, and then we'll open up for a Q&A. So if you might please post any questions you have in the chat, I'll try and get to as many of these as possible. I'll read out your questions if that's all right and then we can you know turn to which wh whoever feels uh, most qualified to answer so this is a solidarity and also a fundraising event it's not an academic talk and the the link to our designated charity for donations which is the women democratic front is in your event bright ticket so all donations no matter how small are very welcome so let me just first give an introduction to our two other speakers so far, first is Dr. Sadiq Banro, who was born in Pakistan, did his first degree in social anthropology from Pakistan. He's currently a senior research fellow at Sheffield Hallam University. He's a social anthropologist, a public health professional, and an interdisciplinary researcher who consciously addresses the social, political, cultural, varied intersections of social problems that he researches. So his broader research area is on inequalities in global public health, particularly on interactions of health, well-being, gender, sexuality, violence and racism. Sadiq's worked in many different countries, including UK, Pakistan, in Indonesia, Kenya and the Philippines. Next, turning to our second speaker, Nihal Bajwa is a PhD student in education at the University of Sussex. She's also vice president of the liberation of liberation and equality at the National University of uh, National Union of Students, excuse me. So uh, Nihal's PhD research focuses on the narratives and practices of fathering and family life in Lahore in Pakistan, with an interest in care and social reproduction, as well as on individual responsibility in the context of structural oppression 
and the political economy of institutions that affect our narratives, our practices and our, and our identities, both now and also over the life course. So Nihal will be contributing um, you know, informally on decolonial approaches and on processes of uh, related knowledge production and the wider question of how or we can all contribute to this of how climate change action and decolonization, how those issues might speak to each other. So we're going to talk for about 15 minutes up to 15 or, or minutes or so each and then open up. So apologies, I don't have any slides. I think Sardik has, but I'll just take a little bit of time to set to, to set the scene. And excuse me, I'm going to refer to my notes. So Pakistan then has been at the very hard end of several climate related disasters this year. In the annual heat waves in March and April, temperatures rose above 49 degrees Celsius. And then the monsoon months from June to the end of August saw torrential rains and flash flooding. This was actually the largest rainfall in three decades and four times the long term average rainfall. And the reason for this was a mix of increased temperatures, overheating and warmer atmospheres, which hold in turn more water and make downpours far more intense. Situation is worsened by the fact that Pakistan also has the world's largest number of glaciers outside the polar regions. So hotter climates, much hotter, much higher temperatures result in considerably more water flowing down from melting ice in the Himalayas. And as a result, surging floods devastated the country, as you will have seen across the global media, and, and they've also precipitated a global humanitarian disaster. So data released last week by the National Pakistan's National Disaster Management Authority stated that numbers of dead stand at around 1,500 people. That's including over 500 children. A UN estimate say that around 33 million Pakistanis have been affected by the floods, that more than 500,000 houses have been destroyed, 700,000 livestock lost, and over 3.6 million acres of crops have also been damaged, which is in turn leading quite alarmingly to food shortages. So in addition to that, thousands of kilometers of roads and bridges have been damaged. And this has hampered relief operations on the ground with thousands of people still stranded and still, or still sleeping outside in the open air. So the climate change minister, Sherry Rahman, um, estimates that over a third of the country has been completely submerged. So Sindh province in the south, which I'm probably going to foc on, focus on a little bit more, has been particularly badly affected as it has been by floods in the past. And flood water has submerged you know, a great deal of farmland. For example, in Dadu district in, in Sindh, two, you know, two large lakes have formed that have engulfed you know, entire villages and turned others into fragile islands. And Pakistani officials warned that it might it probably take three to six months for the waters to recede. And last Saturday, on the 17th of September, the Director General of the WHO issued a statement about the potential for a second disaster. So this, this is referring to a wave of disease and, and death, which has begun to kind of um, engulf the country and to severely impact health systems, leaving millions of people vulnerable. So we've begun to see reports of malaria, dengue fever and waterborne diseases becoming really quite rampant. And the government's also shut off power to present to pre prevent people from getting electrocuted, plunging villages into darkness each night. Um, a great deal, but the majority of villages have not received any aid as yet, according to re residents. And then in terms of the government response, I think Sadiq's going to talk about this in a little bit more depth. You know, this has really been, you know, I think there's a consensus that the government response has been inadequate uh, so far. In addition, Changes resulting from Pakistan's 2015 National Action Plan on Human Rights means that there are heavy restrictions and bureaucratic controls placed on international NGOs, ostensibly to prevent them from engaging in any kinds of political purpose. But this means that agencies uh, such as Save the Children and Action Against Hunger, who previously responded very quickly with, their, with an on-the-ground present, presence in you know, the previous floods, in Pakistan, it means that they're, they're just not there. So then next, you know, 
reaching out to a global audience. Many in Pakistan have been calling for climate change reparations. You know, this was an item that was discussed uh, last year, COP26, you know, the International UN Climate Change Conference. And what, what does that mean? Well, reparations refer to the direction of funds for, for building climate adaptation and resilience systems in the global south, recognizing and offsetting losses from ongoing climate related um, disasters and acknowledging the debt that rich countries with higher emissions and higher impacts on climate owe poorer countries who are in fact suffering the worst effects of climate change. So according to journalists that I've spoken to who've been rep reporting from Sindh um, and Dardin district uh, particularly, the 2022 floods have caused uh, more destruction than the massive devastation that were caused by the 2010 and 2011 floods a decade ago. So uh, while the current floods have been caused largely by torrential rains, the 2010 disaster was caused by uh, riverine floods. That's mostly uh, flooding of the river Indus called, triggered by very heavy rainfall in the mountains of northern Pakistan in July. So they were a bit different because those floods moved down the Indus River from north to south and into, you know, to the Arabian Sea in the south. And they provided sufficient time for regions downstream to set up evacuations. But in this year's floods, there's not the same lag time. So, you know, there's been less time uh, to respond. So I'm just going to say a few words about those floods a decade ago, because I think they're quite, you know, important for, for the historical context. So Pakistan's National Disaster Management Authority stated then that the 2010-2011 floods constituted the worst na natural disaster in national history. Over 2,000 people died and the numbers of affected population in a country of around 180 million were at around 22 million, including 12 million um, needing urgent food aid, over 6 million homeless. So in Sindh province, where a, a high concentration of districts, communities and villages live on and from, you know, from the riverbanks, over 7 million people were affected. And then the floods returned in, you know, 2011, displacing around, you know, in total around 15 million people across Pakistan. So there was widespread condemnation then at the institutional apathy and the very slow government response. In addition, state and humanitarian organizations were ill prepared to deal with communities who have been long vulnerable to floods, to cyclones and displacement. And still, there is no permanent natural disaster strategy or environmental migration policy that exists or that has been effectively developed to cope. And what we're seeing now are kind of partly consequences of that situation. And then, um, I shan't be too much longer, but in that, and then in contrast to the floods, the drylands of southern Sindh also are facing increasing land degradation, desertification and worsening drought conditions. Tarparka district, Sindh's largest district, has long experienced droughts and extreme environmental conditions, which combined with climate change, widespread poverty and a prolonged lack of government response produced a famine in 2013 and 14, 2014, um, with Tarparka district most of, uh, devastatingly affected. And then severe droughts recurred in 2018. So this mix of drought, hunger, land degrada degradation results in changed seasonal and forced migrations, with many affectees from Hindu communities, for example, migrating to nearby districts, many are Muslim, Muslim affectees migrating to the major city of uh, mega city of Karachi and, and Hyderabad. Um, less, but there's that evidence suggests female migrants are working as domestic workers in towns and cities. Some are forced into sex work or women left behind are heading households where men have become jobless or disappeared or migrated or died. And then we have the phenomenon where we're also seeing return migration from the cities to areas such as Tar are due to, for example, a mega open pit coal mining and energy project. So mining projects concentrated in specific locations are forcing minority communities very much to carry the most toxic burden of our global dependence on fossil fuels with um, also kind of markedly higher rates of respiratory illness and cancers. So what we have is a very unequal 
even unequal picture of the effects of the floods, with the poorest being and the most marginalized being most badly affected. In the regional context of communities exclusion from the benefits of their own water resources, a government unwillingness to act. So going forward, it's certainly local public officials, technical experts, um, civil society groups should all be included in a complex assessment of the floods causes and rebuilding of infrastructure to ensure the survival of indigenous fishing, farming communities and to address poverty. So that is a very important step in the context of environmental and also climate justice. And it means addressing the inequitable outcomes of climate change for different people, different places associated with kind of their vulnerability. So that's why it's also important to donate via charity so that those most marginalized can be reached directly. So just very briefly, a little word on climate justice and women, just to broaden the perspective. And violence against women is, you know, and, and to put the context of our charity into perspective, violence against women is really endemic, especially in Sindh, especially in major city of Karachi, which is Pakistan's largest uh, Karachi. Karachi has endured long-standing political and state violence. During those conflicts, women carried many additional burdens for husbands, sons, brothers who were killed, imprisoned or disappeared. Political and structural violence, we also know, co-occurs with hugely increased rates of domestic and sexual violence. Honor crimes, which Sadiq researches, stove burning, settlement, and you know, kind of child marriages, acid attacks, rape, sexual abuse are widespread. In 2010, 50% of all honor crimes, for example, occurred in Sindh. Women activists, medics, academics, and lawyers have long fought for changes. So even in peacetime, violence is endemic. I, 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 the two, 2019 Women, Peace and Security Index, for example, ranked Pakistan very low on discriminatory norms for women. So I just want to say that it's important that we keep these kinds of analyses of structural violence up front if we're going to advance equal rights in kind of um, uh, responses to disasters and also also in public health. And this applies everywhere that women are marginalized, invisibilized, including by the law, which fails women's rights and punishes victims of, rent, of rape. So let's just, before I hand over, understand that it's minority, migrant, transient groups and women who are disproportionately affected. And climate justice and climate change communication means elevating those voices. Climate activism, as we've heard discussed, has historically been a middle class pursuit and minority activists have been ignored, especially in forming policy discussions. And that, that I'm referring now to what Naomi Klein calls the violence of othering in a warming world. So addressing climate change impact requires highlighting the voices of the most marginalized, you know, uh, um, and I think I might leave it there actually, you know, we uh, just to make the point that, you know, severe climate related events in Pakistan, a, debilitate, a debilitating pastoral rural livelihood systems and forcing stressed rural populations to cities, you know, in and around the immediacy and the, the urgency of, uh, uh, you know, kind of current events. Um, so, I haven't actually got a conclusion, so I'm going to leave it there. And uh, thank you for listening to me. And I'm going to hand over next to Sardik, who's going to take control of the screen, I think. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> um, thank you, Nicola, and uh, presenting this. Um, providing the context actually about and uh, I think we will overlap with the many of many of our things. Uh, so uh, thank you Onka for organizing this event and providing me with the opportunity to share my thoughts on the ongoing catastrophe in Pakistan, uh, in particular my homeland Sindh province. Uh, I'm not an expert on floods. Uh, but I have been partly experiencing uh, this ongoing flood, uh, though from distance, but uh, I've been uh, in contact, closely contact with my family and my uh, uh, relatives and other village people who are affected by this uh, 
this ongoing uh, <clears throat> disaster. Uh, and uh, um, as Nikola said in introduction, I was born and raised and educated in Pakistan, and uh, I have been uh, I, I was a part of the one of the disasters uh, in 1992, which I'll talk a little bit about it in later. So uh, <clears throat> I believe natural disasters aren't all that natural and disasters such as floods result from a combination of natural hazards and social and human vulnerability. Calling them natural disaster artificially naturalizes the harms they cause and it is regarded as inevitable. In turn, it becomes an easier for people in power to exploit the manufactured naturalness of disasters and escape from their responsibilities. And this is going on because when they call it as a natural disaster, it means they put the responsibility on some supernatural forces and they avoid their own responsibilities. So no question that climate change plays its part in disasters like floods and unprecedented monsoon rains, but climate change in itself is our making. We have done it, we humans have made it uh, at this point. Uh, German physician anthropologist and politician Rudolf Virko believed that all epidemics were social in origin. So like Virko, I believe disasters like flooding and famine are social and political in origin. Similarly, social and political factors have played a great role in the current natural calamity in Pakistan. So uh, this is, uh, I, I'm going to uh, share some information about Pakistan, those who don't know what is Pakistan and where is Pakistan. I'll talk about Pakistan. So Pakistan is a multi-ethnic and linguistically diverse country. Uh, it is the world's fifth most populous country with a population of almost two, 142 million. Uh, it is a nuclear state with the world's sixth largest standing armed forces. Pakistan is a federal parliamentary republic state. Uh, it's a it, it's federation that comprises four provinces, Punjab, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Sindh, Balochistan, and three territories, Islamabad Capital Territory, Gilgit, Baltistan, and Azad Kashmir. So on one side, you see this is the political map of Pakistan and also geographical. And the other side of the map, you see the red areas are, these are the affected areas by this current flooding. So uh, you can see that the south of uh, Pakistan, this is the uh, Sindh province and also uh, Baloch province. The, the both are uh, worse affected by this uh, uh, <clears throat> disaster. So uh, the current disaster is uh, not new in Pakistan, but the scale is unprecedented. According to a Federal Flood Commission report, Pakistan has witnessed 21, including the current major floods uh, in its uh, um, 75 years history. Uh, so the, uh, a disaster doesn't happen unless people, cities, towns, and villages are vulnerable due to marginalization, discrimination, and inequitable access to resources, knowledge, and support. As uh, Nikki mentioned about these, this is in Pakistan, uh, in Pakistan's case. And these vulnerabilities are further intentionally or un in, unintentionally enhanced by deforestation, rapid urbanization, environmental degradation, and climate change, which is a reality, and Pakistan is uh, on the, uh, um, I mean, bearing the burnt of the climate change. Uh, moreover, vulnerabilities are too often enhanced not because of the information about dealing with the hazards does not exist, but because of the decision makers and those responsible do not use this information appropriately or at all. And in Pakistan, the latter is the case. They don't use the information, which I'll little to talk about it. So the first catastrophe, which is uh, uh, hit the country in 1950, claimed around more than 2,000 lives and flooded around 10,000 villages. Uh, and then the, uh, in the 1992, uh, Pakistan flood was deadly flood caused by five day long heavy monsoon rains and severe weather that occurred in September, this September 1992. I was 11 years old at that time. And I remember 
we had to leave our house and everything because to save our lives. And it was the it was declared the deadliest flood in the history of Pakistan. But the current reports suggest that these deadly uh, this current uh, flooding in 2022 are um, um, severely and more worse than the 2010, as Nikki provided in, uh, information in the context. So, and and that time in 92 flood uh, flood killed over thousand people and submerged around uh, 13,000 villages. Uh, these uh, and floods in 2010 took around uh, 1,900 lives and uh, around 17,000 villages, affecting 21 million people. So the big question is, and now 22 flood have surpassed all the previous flood disasters. The uh, coming reports are came. Still, these are the estimates. There's no uh, state uh, assessment or. Uh, it will be because it's still rescuing operation is going on uh, and there is still a uh, uh, danger for the more flooding from the waterways. So whether the big question in the history of Pakistan in 75 years, 21 floods and they are severely affected the country and the nation, but the, the, is there any uh, the big question is any lesson learned from these things and the simple answer is no there's no lesson is learned from these all experiences so if we talk about this ongoing uh, disaster so un secretary general he visited uh, um, earlier this week uh, last week and remarked that it's unimaginable damage and the humanity has been worst affected. Uh, war, uh, humanity has done war on nature, uh, but the strikes back in sin, but it was not sin that has made the emissions of greenhouse gases that have accelerated climate change so dramatically. So there is a very unfair situation in relation to the level of destruction that we are seeing here in Sindh. So Sindh is the worst affected province in Pakistan uh, in, in current disaster. Even in, in 2010, it was the worst affected uh, region. Um, and the uh, now Angelina Jolie has visited and she visited in 2010 as well. And 25, uh, 2005, uh, two, uh, yeah, she visited and she said, I have never seen anything like this. I am seeing those lives were saved, but I also have been speaking to people and thinking if enough aid doesn't come, they won't be here in the next few weeks. They won't make it. So this situation is so worse that people can't make, people won't be able to make it from uh, this disaster if this uh, uh, any um, urgent uh, aid has not arrived in Pakistan. There was an appeal from uh, UNA and government of Pakistan, but they said it's less than 50% uh, those placed are made uh, satisfied. They, people haven't, they have placed, but there is no funding has arrived. So, uh, according to estimates, 33 million people have affected. So it means one in seven of the population, uh, one in seven person is affected. More than 1,500 people have been killed and more than 1,300 injured. These are just estimates and these are recorded by some newspapers and media reports or some agencies, but there's no systematic uh, and data collection about and the system recording of this incident. And there are many, many far, far more villages and uh, they, um, deaths have occurred, uh, injuries occurred, they are not reported in here. So these are very uh, underestimated figures. 1.7 million homes have been destroyed or badly damaged. Again, the, we don't know exact figures are much, much higher than these. 900 health facilities across the country have been damaged and 3.6 million acres of crops have been affected and 900,000 livestock lost. Again, these are estimates and then um, some according to uh, Faisal Edhi, uh, the who runs the charitable trust, uh, Abdul Sattar Edhi Trust, and he said 90% uh, uh, of crops in Sindh province are 
have been affected. So the scale of uh, uh, the damage is uh, unprecedented and the, the consequences after this is are really unimaginable. So disease, death, uh, malnutrition, and uh, um, the shortage of food is uh, already is started. And uh, so this is the biggest human in, uh, humanita humanitarian disaster so far we have seen. These are some of the pictures I can show you uh, uh, from these uh, uh, different areas. Uh, so you can see uh, the, the the scale of the damage. So a scale of the disaster from these pictures. So and these are taken initially from in the, in the first week. These pictures are taken first week. So and it's still water is there. All uh, majority of villages who were uh, affected by the disaster, the water is still there. People are in the temporary tents, are on the banks of the uh, 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 roads, and uh, they have no facilities, nothing at all. And the government response has been really, really, really bad. So uh, government initially started, so giving them uh, 25,000 Pakistani rupees, which is equal to 92 pounds through a, a social security program, Benazir income support program. So this was is nothing. And mainly people, if they received this uh, fund, initial fund from the government, they were not able to use because there was no transport. They were, uh, can't go from remote villages to the towns and cities to buy something. And uh, towns and cities are, were also under the water. So there was nothing use of this money, even if they got it initially and they were given. And this is not for the, all people who are affected, but this was only for those who were uh, registered in under this uh, uh, BISP program uh, and in, under this social protection program. And Yes, and the rescue operation was uh, again at selected places. Uh, Army and other um, uh, agencies, they helped them and they are doing, but it was not enough. So that's why many people and pro people's property has been drowned in the water. And the government has built 10 cities, and, but its uh, facilities are inadequate, uh, inadequate because uh, there are no toilets for women, and uh, uh, there is no any other facilities for children. So there's no protection. So uh, as uh, uh, Nicola mentioned that the uh, women are worst affected, women and children are most affected. And again, these 10 cities are the flood relief camps are the uh, breeding grounds for the violence against the women and girls and in particular the honor crimes or the violence against women in the name of uh, so-called honor. Uh, government has established some medical camps in some areas, particular areas, but still again, uh, the inflation before, even before the um, uh, this disaster was so high, people can't afford even paracetamol. And today uh, I read a news government is considering uh, some uh, relief from uh, to even people can buy the just simple parastamol. So this is the, uh, um, I mean, uh, you, uh, I can Im can imagine the, the situation. So why Pakistan, uh, I mean, in 2010, uh, um, situation of, uh, uh, I mean, response was much more quicker than now 2022 and it was, uh, it was not as high quality or up to the mark, but it was uh, better than now. And technologically and everything Pakistan has uh, advanced, but why, what happened in 2010 and why can't happen, why it wouldn't happen in now in 2022? The one thing is more, it's uh, the Pakistan is socially and politically divided. No one have seen ever, ever it happened now, like now since 2018. Until now, Pakistan society, uh, Pakistani society is divided at every level. From uh, if you can start from a household to even national, they are divided, and uh, an economic situation is getting worse every day. 
uh, as uh, uh, Nikola also mentioned, restriction for INGOs because of the uh, uh, the killing of uh, Osama bin Laden in uh, Batabad and the role of so-called role of some international NGOs in that and they, the restriction have increased, some laws were passed, so there's no, and this was not in the case in 2010. And both situation, economic position was a little bit better than this and Pakistan was at least not at that level divided. Uh, data is mounting every day and that's why Pakistan is creating kind of a case for uh, international community to help them to, to get a relief in the debt because of the debt and uh, debt servicing uh, Pakistan inflation is uh, going up and also Pakistan currency is uh, getting down and down every day. Inequalities at all level from uh, neighborhood to village to um, district to province to uh, in all our countries are growing. And so uh, the, this, uh, uh, with all this, th there is a difference between because what happened in 2010 and what now, and even international support in 2010 was much, much higher than uh, now. It's not arrived yet uh, timely. So the bottom line is that uh, when I spoke to many people and they said, uh, government isn't doing enough for people affected by the floods. So government response is, is a government response is really uh, 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 kind of um, not uh, adequate for these people. <clears throat> so what could be the the next? Um, so the, and the thing is uh, inequality, poverty, and political ideology, class, power, relationship are the root cause of these vulnerabilities that turn natural hazards into disasters. Uh, making some more vulnerable than others. And in this case, women are more vulnerable and they die more and they suffer domestic violence and other type of violence here. Even it was reported in some newspapers that the uh, women uh, complained that they can't, even if they, there are in many camps, there are no toilets to use them, but in there, some camps, there, if there are toilets, they can't go there because of fear. So because they are scared, can't use them. So this is the situation for women. And other forms of gender violence also, as I said earlier, that it's uh, these camps are kind of a breeding ground for violence against women and girls and insecurity after disasters. Uh, they bear large work burden during recovery and barriers to obtaining uh, grants, funds to build houses when all the documentation in the husband's name. So the patriarchal society all goes with the men and women can't do anything, they are really vulnerable. So in this whole um, West situation, what is to be, Pakistan needs support from the world and world but need to support them, they should support them, otherwise this, this disaster will become really, really worse. Uh, when fair and transparent distribution of relief funds and efforts, which has been uh, 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 because there is lack of trust among different uh, uh, social groups or Pakistani uh, federated units. Uh, um, and now the Balochistan and Sindh are most affected, but when it comes to the distribution of funds is put somewhere else are used by some powerful institutions uh, instead of giving them those who are the victims. And there's need of fair, a fair assessment of damage, that what is damage, a fair assessment from the independent organization, not the Pakistan government, because the Pakistan government again, exploit those figures and facts. Uh, controlling the outbreaks of weapon and vector-borne diseases. This is the major and key concern now. And uh, there are reports, mainly people have died because of malaria, um, it's again, so there is need should be surveillance and control on these things. Mm -hmm. Rehabilitation without any delay. I mean, if we delay it long, the, it will get worse. So rehabilitation is required. And the for the Pakistan, from the climate justice point of view, they need to build a strong case. They got the evidence now. And a strong case for the international community, not only the other countries, but the, even within climate justice. <laughs> Uh, Pakistan and uh, in, internally, 
because there are some groups and communities they are more vulnerable and they are um, more uh, they bear the more burden of these uh, disasters than others so they need to have a social justice within the country and then they can claim for pakistan outside the country thank you very much thank you so much sadik for such a comprehensive and personal talk thank you so much that was brilliant um, let me hand over then, um, without any further ado, to Nihal, who is going to pick up and enrich our insights from there. Thank you. Okay, so this is really a kind of now for something completely different, but I'm sorry um, if it seems too, too, too different. But um, my research, my PhD, actually I was going to find myself because I sometimes really can go on. So let me just, yeah, let's just put on there. Okay, that would be great. Um, so my PhD research is actually on um, fathering and family life in Lahore, which is like a big job. So we saw the map earlier. Um, it's the most populous, not the most populous, sorry, but it's one of the most populous provinces. Um, and there, you know, I really focus on kind of practices of care and caregiving in around children in early childhood um, and people's everyday lives. And kind of in particular, but there's two kind of going to go into that too much, but there's two kind of main concerns that were leading me through this, I guess. And one was pushing back um, uh, against, among other things, like this set of ideas that Pakistani fathers were not involved in their children's lives in particular. And I was like, what does that mean? What does that mean? Like, firstly, what is involvement and what doesn't count? And secondly, who said this? Like, it's in the of the evidence but people kept saying this like people kept producing these kinds of papers and saying we need to make them more involved um and then and then like where is it coming from because they, they must be they are involved they do things um in you know there's lots of evidence i'm not going to go into again to suggest that they are doing all these things so why aren't we seeing it um and what what is kind of driving this um idea that they're not involved who is it kind of serving so that that's kind of a critical engagement with like what we think we know and why we think we know it and um which fails to kind of see local knowledges and expertise but also some people as being able to do good or do caring or do love and that's quite that's quite damaging um but also more broadly i'm really concerned with pushing back against this culture of individualizing in lots of different ways, but specifically individualizing responsibility for how um, how and the extent to which people do things the best way, or the, the healthiest way, or the greenest way, or the um, you know the way that we think is right, as if there aren't these kind of. Firstly, as if the way we think is right is right. We clearly all live um, well. We know the way that we live. <laughs> we know the kind of hurtling towards destruction that our kind of economy is also is also doing, but. And then secondly, as if there aren't all these structures that kind of shape and determine, like shape their experiences over their life and also determine kind of their choices and their strategies within, within these really very real constraints and limits. Um, and, and, you know, people are negotiating caring and love and survival at the same time. And that's like intense pressure, just as anyone is anywhere in the world, you know, any family is. Um, and I guess both of those things are obviously applicable I, I argue, and I think that they are obviously applicable on the very minor and small and everyday practices, um, something that we consider so private and kind of individual, like family and care. Um, but actually, some, you know, you might agree from the way I framed it, but maybe I haven't framed it very clearly, but it's also so clearly applicable to something like the climate. And our relationship with the climate and people's individual and collective behavior in the context of climate change um which has been something that's both so my eyes <laughs> something that's been so powerfully um shaping our lives actually longer than most of us were alive you know these processes have been in place for a really really long time um and oh i'm oh, sorry my notes are on a piece of paper which is never great is it but um so if we think about this we think about how pakistan as a country by which I mean, you know, one that's so far away and one that's so different in some ways or seen as so different um, and which is experiencing this kind of unimaginable destruction at the moment. 
there are so many reasons that we might have for kind of, which are absolutely wrapped around the systems of value and knowledge production and education itself and the way we live, um, that we might kind of look away from that or find ourselves feeling it's really difficult to engage with from a position of sameness or identity, you know, as anything other than like something very different and very other um, in how, whatever ways. Um, and we might find comfort in that othering kind of subconsciously, but also less subconsciously maybe. Um, and I kind of want to bring it back to our responsibility, not just to people in Pakistan, like but actually to ourselves. Um, this isn't, obviously this is a matter of climate justice and fairness, um, but actually I feel like more fundamentally, this is a matter of sort of a question of collective liberation and not just people in Pakistan and their liberation, ours. Because, you know, there are no, for example, there are no plans to stop in this country, even though, even though people can like, who are involved in fracking, the companies involved in it, uh, think that it's not worth doing in this country, it won't generate the kinds of energy we need. Still, that that's not what's driving these choices, you know. And, you know, there's no, um, we have, we're not investigating, sorry, we're not investing in the UK in infrastructure to um, heat our houses or make them more green or insulate them. Um, you know, we lack power to force our government to make choices as well. We lack the same governance power that those people affected by the floods in Pakistan lack. Um, and so we also stand to kind of lose out quite significantly, very immediately in terms of discomfort. Some people will face huge, huge bills. Some people will face homelessness. People have been facing homelessness for kind of a couple of decades and longer obviously in this country, but more intensely in that time. But also, you know, if we're gonna, people will be very, very cold. People will be very isolated. There's a very tr low trust environment. All these things are beginning to happen to us. Um, but there's no plan for our future either. Like our future is very tied up with the future of everyone around the world. So what I kind of want to say is this is a question of solidarity. This is a question of common interest, which is what solidarity has to be based on. So then, okay, let paper noises, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, and obviously like some people at the sharp end, you know, the sharper end of that, even in the UK, there are some people at the sharper end of the kind of climate related um, non-planning or non-inaction. Um, but there are people, the kind of people affected by the floods are at the very sharpest end globally at the moment. And they can't avoid the fight, you know, it's on their doorstep. It's a fight for survival. They can't escape it, they can't deny it, you know, they have no choice. But our fates are kind of 100% intertwined um, and no amount of financial stability or happiness in relationships or success will kind of save any of us from the effects of this unless they don't, you know, unless people don't much care about their older age or they don't much care about their children. I don't think very many of us fall into that camp. So I feel like there's nothing better we can do actually than to see this as our own struggle. And that's very alarming initially, but actually, it, there, are, there is hope in that. There's a kind of collective hope because then if we start seeing this as this is something we can do something about, we can start building solidarity with each other because what we know we need is like a way of enforcing, yeah, basically forcing our governments to act. Um, and I look at the families in my research, I guess, the families that I interview in Lahore, um, like I look at the families that live on my street or the families I'm involved with in the UK. And I guess that's kind of at the root of decolonizing, right? Is to say, you know, let's push back against all these narratives we've learned at, the, at, at what is the essence of humanity. Like it's not um, ableist, it's not kind of based along capitalist lines, it's not um, intrinsically any number of kind of oppressions. But in both those cases, the government isn't doing enough. So the government isn't doing enough for people affected by the floods and like, you know, Sadiq has shown this really clearly and we can see exactly what that looks like. The government isn't doing enough to protect our people from, in the UK, from the cold or, or even the future, you know. So in both cases, we lack this ability to force people to do something, but that isn't beyond our control. And I guess this for me is another key element of decolonizing. Um, and I don't think it's usually considered as such, but 
part of um, accepting the structures of power in the world is accepting, I think, who can and can't have power. And I think a lot of our activism, a lot of our organizing, a lot of our self-image and our image of the world is based around this idea that people with power have decision-making power. And all we can do is ask. And all we can do is really like show them how much we care. And then hopefully they'll agree. But actually there's a really strong reason to suggest that anyone can have power. You know, there is no like vulnerable person there who needs to be protected and who needs to be like handed things. What they need to be handed is a sense of their own power and the ability to organize together. And I think, I guess, going back to those two things, there's two things I think we can do, which is firstly, stop trying to play the game and win the game because it's very exhausting. And I think, you know, that denialism is, there, is not, not really helping us. But apart from that, once we start doing that, we can kind of get back to win ourselves some time and some space to get back to each other and to our communities and sort of start organizing them and pushing back together. And I think it's actually much easier than, I mean, you know, we've, I think the problem, the, the kind of um, thing that we face sometimes is this fear of how to do it. What do we do, do I do a petition? Do I go and organize in the street? That's very exhausting. It's fine, it can be done. The output, you know, will it achieve anything? It's very tiring to go to demo. It's very tiring to organize a demo. You know, like these are not effective actions necessarily all the time for everyone. But more importantly, they're not accessible. So anything that we do in this country or anything that we do in Pakistan has to involve every single person. There is a role for every single person. So it has to be doable around like our childcare, around our jobs, around our, you know, looking after each other, around caring responsibilities. So I think, but there are methods out there um, and they're widely taught. Uh, Jane McAlevey does a kind of organizing school for trade unions, but the, the methods are the same for everybody. And she's like, you know, you can in five or six months organize a workplace for 100% turnout at a strike. Maybe we're not doing that, but maybe we're trying to do something else. But when we figure out what it is we're trying to do, what I'm kind of getting us to see is that if we see it as our responsibility, but we see that responsibility as one which therefore has to be manageable for every single person, we can sort of start to see that, um, feel our power a little bit and start thinking in more kind of calm and sustainable ways about what that might look like. Um, I think this is probably, not exactly what I was expected to say, but it's really the only thing that I want to say these days. So um, I'll stop there. Thanks so much. That was actually fantastic, really strong, disruptive critique of normativity and call for solidarity, you know, and, you know, to counteract some of that despair because that's, you know, such an overwhelming, you know, feeling isn't it response to what's going on it's one of despair but I think by organizing or collectivizing or kind of just creating little spaces of hope little spaces where even you know and that's where the local's really important where we can come together and you know dare to dream and to disrupt you know I think you know in that there's of course there's strength beyond what we're able to do as individuals or, or beyond our own hopelessness really I, I, they were brilliant talks. Thank you so much. Um, do we have any questions? We've got two minutes. Oh, okay. So we've got a question from Gabriella. So we, we just have time to answer this. I'm going to read it out, Gabriella. Okay, for the panel about climate justice, what are the cultural discourses you've noticed um, that exist in relation to this particular event? For example, I was very shocked to see a clip on Twitter from Talk TV basically saying Pakistan is responsible for what's happened to them because they've decided not to, to invest in fossil fuels. Is that right? There must be other discourses and would like to ask you in your opinion, which are the most predominant ones at the moment? Maybe that's one for Sadiq there. I think uh, uh, it's not fair to say because Pakistan, it, it's been well established and there's evidence Pakistan is only responsible for 1% of the all the emissions coming from and then how it could be responsible for all these. Yes, there are other things which make uh, in managing the disaster or something doing with it, but actually, the, as you mentioned, Nikki, in your presentation about the uh, melting of uh, 
glaciers and the uh, heat waves and the temperatures rise in, this is not Pakistan's doing. It's all the developing uh, developed countries, developed industrialized nations. Pakistan has no industry at all. I mean, Pakistan is suffering uh, uh, other sin. Of course, there yeah. are many problems yeah. I can tell about Pakistan, but not this one. Yeah, uh, yeah. I and think I think there's this a... is other, that's why climate justice is really. Yeah, key. there's a very big difference, I think, bet between indicting the government of Pakistan, which I think we must and we should, we and must, then should, blaming yeah. Pakistan for, for the yeah. floods. Um, but that was a provocative question. Any more? Um, I was going to just jump in as well on that, if that's okay. Yeah, sorry now. No, 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 which is just like, how can it be anyone's responsibility? Like, and even any one country, actually, if we think about it, like, mm. this is such a global thing. Like, how do we globally and together control temperature of the... Um, but I've also seen this quite, quite... Somebody, um, my aunt wrote, she's a, a therapist, and she wrote to all the other therapists about this and said, could we, you know, could we fundraise? And they said, and one person replied, Yes, you know, you're actually right because I, I saw on the news the other day that Pakistan, Pakistani government did try and like plant lots of trees and do all these things. Oh. But climate change, climate change advanced at such a rate that it kind of, you know, overwhelmed their defenses. So they were trying. And I'm like, whether or not they were trying, you know, like, yeah, yeah I think there's, there's narratives about like responsibility, mm -hmm. individual responsibility. It's because we know we treat ourselves that way and we think that way ourselves. Yeah. And they project it outwards, but it definitely powerful. Be move beyond assigning blame oh, oh gabriella sorry it's not that it's what the tv program was arguing got you not attributing that whatsoever to you <laughs> um but on the note that we should perhaps stop assigning blame except where it's maybe useful insofar as reparations or evening out the the board somehow or kind of taking collective a shared responsibility not expecting all the benefits you know without at the expense of half the world not that we are benefiting when we're freezing and you know also battling um is a starting point isn't it so does anybody have a last word but before we close because it's seven it's just after seven and we've gone over time um, I'd like to say thank you to both Sadiq and, and Neha for really fantastic talks. I've really enjoyed this session. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you both. Thank you, Gabriella, as well. Thank you, everybody on Facebook. Thank uh, you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Monica, for organizing this. Okay, do we leave it there then? Okay, so thanks, everybody. Bye now. Bye, bye. Stephanie, do you want to turn off the recording.